Alas. Tonight. Hoy en Alas, decolamos con The Discovery Channel y el B-25 de North American. Durante la Segunda Guerra Mundial, la maquinaria de Estados Unidos produjo miles de aviones militares, pero quizás el más importante de estos fue el B-25 de North American. Apodado la novia de las fuerzas, sirvió virtualmente en todos los frentes y con todos los aliados. Desde Sicilia hasta Saipán, el fuertemente armado B-25 demostró ser bombardero y avión de ataque a tierra. Hoy, volamos alto con el B-25 de North American en... Alas. A finales de 1930, la Fuerza Aérea de Estados Unidos adoptó la política de tener al menos dos aviones para cada una de sus necesidades identificadas. Con esta política, uno de los bombarderos medianos que se desarrollaron fue el B-25 de North America. Describir a este avión como un éxito sería subestimarlo. No solo llenó los requerimientos originales, sino que también llenó los funcionales. Es uno de los pocos aviones que han volado la Fuerza Aérea, la Naval y la Marina, y fue fueron sus tripulaciones las que lo apodaron la novia de las fuerzas. Entre otras, la menor de sus distinciones era ser el único avión norteamericano de la Segunda Guerra Mundial al que se le dio el nombre de una persona, ya que el nombre oficial del B-25 cuando se empezó a fabricar era Mitchell. El nombre se dio en honor al general Billy Mitchell, que sirvió en la Primera Guerra Mundial y que predijo un conflicto futuro dependería de los resultados de la guerra en el aire. Contra una considerable oposición tanto del ejército como de la naval, demostró el potencial del poder aéreo cuando hundió un barco de guerra alemán bombardeándolo desde un bimotor primitivo. La visión de Mitchell y su terca insistencia en el poder aéreo no tenían importancia en la opinión de los jefes de servicio. Between the wars, the Army Air Corps, restricted in funds, was often limited to mercy flights, dropping food parcels, and was relegated to delivering the mail. Power was being more fully appreciated by other powers as an effective means to an end. Italy had used bombers with devastating effect over Spain, and by 1935, Mussolini's forces were being used against Ethiopia with overwhelming results. Against the primitive resources of Ethiopia, the impact of the Italian planes was crushing, and despite Haile Selassie's pleas to the League of Nations, nothing was done by the other powers. By 1936, the emperor had been forced into exile, leaving his country to its fate and the League to its demise. The turning of world events produced a few tremors within the USA, and perhaps significantly in that year, cadets from West Point were given their first formal training in aerial combat. Nineteen thirty six was also the year in which North American Aviation committed their company to aircraft production with a new factory in Los Angeles. For the day, their product, like this observation plane with retracting undercarriage and other relatively advanced features, were sophisticated designs. Greater success followed in the shape of their series of single-engine basic trainers, which were used in a variety of roles by various countries' armed services. 
This brilliant and versatile aircraft was to earn a reputation as being not only a well-designed plane, but also a very well-built plane. The quality of the organization of the manufacture was, in itself, impressive. North American first met failure with its design for a twin-engine long-range bomber. Originally, five XB-21s had been ordered by the Air Force, but only one example was ever produced. While the 21 featured advanced technologies such as automated gun turrets, there were shortcomings in the behavior of the plane itself. However, it did give North American an excellent opportunity to explore the real needs of bomber design, and it allowed them the chance to demonstrate to the military decision makers that they were active in the field and beginning to come to terms with the relatively novel form of aerial warfare and the supporting philosophies, such as the concept of the independent defense of bombers by arming them with multiple rapid-fire machine guns. Undaunted by the failure of the B-21, North American Aviation proceeded to develop another design, and using its own money, it produced the NA-40. This model took the sophistication further, including tricycle undercarriage, enabling landing at high speed. This is a model of the NA-40 in wind tunnel testing. The model's twin fins are adopted as a means of gaining greater directional stability. All in all, the design was considered vastly superior to its predecessor, but still more improvements were envisioned. By the end of 1939, world events had taken further steps toward disaster as Europe was swallowed by a new war distinguished by the German demonstration of the overriding importance of air power. Atlantic, worried planners were reflecting on Mitchell's prophecies, and among other designs pushed into development was the NA-40, with emergency provisions that the wing be lowered and the fuselage widened. These changes were considered to be essential, and the design was assessed favorably enough for orders to be placed for 178 of the new type off the drawing board. The first of the fuselages was dedicated to weight testing, with the main support removed, added weight was placed all around the structure to test the design's resilience under stress. Thousands of pounds of lead ingots were fixed around, hung from, and placed within the aluminum frame in attempts to identify any weakness that might endanger the aircraft under combat stress. The widened body would carry heavier loads than were originally intended, and resulting pressures might prove too much for the design. If you look carefully here, you can see the panels rippling under the enormous sustained pressure, but the tests did prove the fuselage to be adequate. Elsewhere, accurate one-twelfth scale models of the new design were catapulted into water to explore the shape's behavior in a ditching. Back 
Back at the factory, different skills were being employed. Here, pattern makers prepare a mold for the top of the engine nacelle. You can see the scoop, which will force air into the carburetor of the powerful radial engines, which will propel the new North American design, now known as the B-25. Molten metal is poured as production of parts for the bomber begins in earnest. fabrication shop, workers begin to assemble the fuselage on a jig, and slowly the airplane's form starts to take shape. The very early construction of the B-25 still employed a great deal of manual skills and hard labor. At this stage of production, the planes were the product of tradesmen's individual skills, since most fabrication was crafted by hand. early Mitchells would find their way to the United Kingdom, where they were soon embroiled in that country's involvement in the war. Early analysis from the British forces in Europe suggested that the Mitchells were far too light, and probably drawing on the B-21 developments, the manufacturers installed new turrets, including one in the lower fuselage, which operated by periscope. Las defensas agregadas, aunque no disponibles en todos los modelos, demostrarían ser oportunas, porque el 7 de diciembre de 1941 se escribió otro capítulo en los acontecimientos del mundo, cuando los japoneses lanzaron su devastador ataque sobre Pearl Harbor. Estados Unidos en la guerra pasarían menos de seis meses antes de que naciera su propia fuerza de bombarderos, entrenada para atacar la capital japonesa. La retaliación se lograría con aviones multimotores, operando desde un portaaviones, aunque se estudiaron varios diseños, solo el versátil Mitchell ofrecía la habilidad para decolar y aterrizar en un área tan limitada y viajar a la distancia requerida. Un equipo de voluntarios se había entrenado a la perfección en decolajes rápidos desde bases en tierra. La naturaleza tolerante del B-25 se probó al máximo. En esa época, aviones y tripulaciones se embarcaron en el portaaviones Hornet y se sentía la confianza de poder hacer bien el trabajo. The task force approached Japan carefully, but while still short of the intended takeoff point, the ships were sighted by Japanese fishing boats. The boats were sunk, but not before they had made radio transmissions. Accordingly, the task force, with the risk of the loss of the carrier uppermost in their minds, decided to launch their raid early.
The attack on Tokyo cost several American lives, and all of the planes used were lost, ditching in the sea or crash landing. The raid had three important effects, demonstrating to the Japanese people that their homeland was not invulnerable to attack from American forces, causing the Japanese government to realize the same message and tie up a considerable percentage of its military power in defense of its home shores, and perhaps most importantly, giving a boost to the U.S. morale. The raid displayed the enormous courage of the crews which participated, and Doolittle, the leader of the raid in all regards, was fittingly given the Congressional Medal of Honor. Standing to his left is General Hap Arnold, who was Chief of Staff for the Air Force. This is General Arnold again, seen on a visit to North American Aviation's plant in Los Angeles, looking over the factory, fives, and the modifications to the plane that were being constantly evaluated. It was made various parts of the collection of the B-20 people and was considered a prime elaborate camouflage hot cal effect and in The Los Angeles effort even included commandeering the Hollywood Park race course. During the war years, the recreation of horse racing was suspended components for the B-20 administration office and conception. Aged in the armed forces, for the, the demands of the military grew, the war effort gained more proportionally. Once completed, the planes were immediately swept into the conflict and sometimes destroyed within weeks of production. The Mitchells found their way to practically every theater of World War II in many guises. An early taste of fire came in North Africa, where he's Africa Corps. Mitchells of the Army Air Force flew alongside B-24 Liberators and B of eventual evacuation of German forces. Here, the Mitchells were employed in much the way they had been designed, as a conventional medium-range bomber. In this role, it had to run the gauntlet of anti-aircraft fire without deviation, with the bomb aimers focused on their targets. En 1942, el apoyo bombardero a los aterrizajes de la Operación Torch en el norte de África francesa jugó un papel importante en la acción y en la campaña que le siguió, pero los pilotos pagaron un precio. El B-25 podía resistir un daño considerable en el aire, continuar. Bomber groups operating from a base in northern Australia made an unauthorized field modification to the standard B-25s. They gave them a more substantial forward firepower by placing added machine guns in the wings just outside of the propeller arc. These men, with their frontline experience, had perceived another role for the Mitchell, ignoring its supposed specialization as a conventional bomber and using it as a low-level ground attack weapon. News of the success of these early flight modifications quickly got back to engineers at Inglewood. Concerned by the danger of damage to the wings, they banned continuance of the practice. Yet, they promptly started to investigate the idea themselves back at the factory. 
At first, experiments were made with two additional 50 caliber machine guns located on the outside of the fuselage beside the pilot. The plane immediately gained in firepower, but the impact of the guns and weight of the installation so close to the cockpit caused concern. If you look carefully, you can see the effect of the firing on the thin aluminum surface inches from the pilot's seat. To compensate, heavy-duty plates were added to the design. Four more 50 caliber machine guns were mounted in the nose, providing the Mitchell with more forward firepower than many fighters. The success of the manufacturer's experiments and the need for a versatile gun platform resulted in an extremely different plane from that conceived by the designers in the original concept. Soon, the Inglewood plant was turning out the solid nose variant with its stubby profile with little to announce the special devastation it could produce. Later, solid nose Mitchells were given even greater firepower as the success of the plane in its new configuration became evident and suggested further experiments. The modification procedure itself became refined and streamlined. Here, two gun cells are fitted with 50 calibers in a simple and efficient process. This efficiency carried over into the installations on the planes, making them easy to maintain in the field in the often primitive conditions of forward bases. You can see how easily these weapons can be attended to. how effective they are. The later models had the dorsal turret moved forward, where, if needed, its two 50s could be added to the plane's awesome barrage. Shifting the dorsal turret left the rear of the plane even more undefended and could only be carried out in conjunction with equipping the B-25 with a proper tail gun position for the first time. Here, twin 50s are installed, giving the Mitchell the same rear protection as the Boeing Flying Fortress. The ventral turret had never been a success, the periscope proving difficult to use, and it had been discarded. Side protection was afforded by single 50s. Standard solid nose 25s were therefore deploying the protection of 14 machine guns, and some planes were to carry even more. Many Mitchells had an additional forward firing weapon that was truly extraordinary a single fixed cannon firing a 75 millimeter projectile. This awesome weapon, basically a naval cannon, was for many years the largest gun ever fitted to a U.S. plane. It was mounted directly below the pilot seat with a highly effective damper to absorb the recoil of the gun. You can see here the size of the shell of the cannon and imagine its effect. The radio operator was given the task of reloading the cannon one at a time with the 14 rounds that were carried. 
The Mitchells of all three services were able to use firepower against naval targets that was unprecedented in its ferocity and its effectiveness. Tracers from the machine guns were used to adjust position to aim the plane before firing the cannon. South Pacific was one theater where the added forward firepower was very much employed. This was an ideal environment for the B-25. The Japanese island strongholds did not need the saturating attention of heavy bombers, like the industrialized centers of Europe. Rather, they needed the more surgical excision of the low-flying and more selective Mitchell. The precision of the 25s provided great yet economical results. Mitchell crews flying all versions worked the Pacific Islands, either on planned strikes or simply patrolling, looking for targets of opportunity. In either situation, the Mitchells swept in on their targets at treetop height and accurately blasted them. The Japanese fought back fiercely, and many Mitchells suffered violent ends, sometimes at the hands of flak or ground fire, and sometimes at the hands of the occasional zero. Although the Mitchell was a robust fighting machine, its use at low level meant that it often presented itself as an accessible target. Information coming back to North America on the losses among the Mitchells caused the company to make the line even more resilient. These aircraft coming off the production line have armored plate under the windscreen and the area painted yellow is heavily armored. Production at Inglewood continued as it did at the Kansas City plant not only for all three of the U.S. forces, but for the Allied Air Forces, including the RAF and the Red Air Force. Here is a very late model Navy variant and its near identical Air Force counterpart, standing side by side in the final stages of production.
Some naval Mitchells were equipped to handle a single torpedo, which was mounted below the bomb bay, so that the doors could not be fully closed with it in position. Only after the release of the weapon could the fuselage be sealed. Though effective, this must have been a very drafty way to go to war. Less than totally successful. Muy exitoso con las aerobáticas bombas de acero de la época, el B-25 todavía continuó lanzando bombas convencionales desde grandes alturas. como fue la destrucción de la fuente de suministro japonés fue la exitosa provisión de suministro naval aliado vital para los campos de batalla battlefields hundreds of thousands of bombs moved around the world in their holds munitions of all descriptions found their way to the fronts and to the bombers which delivered them Specialist ordnance is loaded into a squadron of B-25s prior to takeoff for attacks against the Japanese base at Rabaul. Looking weary and war-worn, these Mitchells, which appear to be the sea model, make their way on one more mission. The distinctive paintwork of many U.S. squadrons served more to promote group morale rather than intimidate the enemy. But with the level of attack employed by the Mitchells, it's certain that some of their markings would have been clearly visible to the Japanese troops. The Mitchell was not as big and fast as its counterpart, the B-26, but it was undeniably more liked by its crews. For the crew of the B-25, there was B-25, el avión era cómodo en su maniobrabilidad, en su robustez, en su capacidad para recibir daño y aún así volar. Y además de todo eso, en el hecho de que era fácil de abandonarlo en caso de emergencia. Este ataque se lleva a cabo con bombas en paracaídas, las cuales al descender lentamente dan tiempo al Mitchell para escapar del impacto. Here, if you look at the 
si observa cuidadosamente, puede ver el efecto de la bomba de asalto. Esta se balancea sobre la tierra hacia el blanco, explotando al segundo contacto, dando de nuevo tiempo al bombardero para escapar de la explosión. Advancing U.S. troops would see the results of these raids in the form of wrecked Japanese aircraft, bizarre and stark monuments to the effectiveness of the B-25s and other Allied attack planes. The Mitchell, even though it had been evolving steadily from its original role, was still very much the same plane as originally submitted to the Defense Department back before the U.S. involvement in the war. En 1944, en la planta Englewood de North American, se hizo el último B-25, aunque la planta de Kansas continuó su fabricación hasta el final de la guerra. La fábrica de California se destinó exclusivamente a la construcción del P-51 Mustang y luego al desarrollo de la turbina, que conduciría a aviones como el F-86. Estos aviones, los últimos en salir de la planta de California, son una tanda de modelos 1000H. A que salen de la pista el último avión en last one ever manufactured at the plant. Named Old Bones, it was covered with signatures and messages from the plane's builders, the workers at the factory, and looked slightly bizarre with its graffiti covering. It was deployed to action through India and saw service with exactly the same appearance. The crew never wanted to cover the handiwork of those who had built the plane that would hopefully see them home again. Many B-25 survived the war and returned to the U.S. In the post-war years, many continued in service in a variety of roles. In the majority of cases, the plane's immense firepower was removed, but the planes remained useful, serving as trainers, transports, and communications vehicles. Many surplus Mitchells were purchased as private planes and refitted as executive transports. The versatile basic design took all these tasks in its stride. At the end of the day, the Mitchell had been produced in greater numbers than any other Allied twin-engine bomber and it had seen service in more theaters and in the forces of more countries and services than any of its counterparts. Even today, the few still in the air are a joy to fly, responsive, calm, and forgiving. It is no wonder that it earned itself the title, Sweetheart of the Forces. <laughs>